G'day everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's Chris Lane. I'm a philosopher of science, conservation science over at uh, Sydney Uni. And today I'm going to be discussing my paper against ecological neoliberalism. Now, really, my aim for this talk is, first of all, to convince you that there is a position out there which is worthy of this title. If I've done that much, then I'll consider this a success. But as well, I'm going to present some reasons you should be uh, really sceptical of this particular position. All right. Hmm. There we go. All right. So, uh, previous. So, ecological neoliberalism is an idea which has emerged out of the larger movement, uh, which I'm referring to as invasive species scepticism. Uh, this is a growing movement which is deeply critical of invasive species science and the control of invasive species. Now, while it's a growing movement, it's not particularly new. But whereas previously a lot of the arguments directed against invasive species control and the science were directed against uh, controlling these populations on welfare grounds, more and more the recent arguments have focused on uh, contesting the actual science involved. And the fact that uh, many of these people are contesting the science involved has led to some accusing them of being science denialist. Now, I'm not actually going to engage in this argument, you know, the extent to which, you know, this is a science denialist movement or not, or whether it's on par with climate change. Instead, I'm going to be looking at a couple of arguments which look to contest invasive species control on what can be thought of as environmentalist grounds. Uh, on the principles of environmentalism, we shouldn't control invasive species. Now, before going on, I want to give a short summary of what I see as ecological neoliberalism. Uh, after giving this short summary, I'm going to go into some of the background and then go into the position in a lot more detail. So conservation ecology has historically been done in a way in which it's directed towards the preservation of existing communities. So we look to preserve, to conserve, to maintain, to restore ecological systems to some sort of previous state. And part of this act involves protecting these populations and these ecosystems against the free movement of other populations. So the introduction of what are known as alien species. So these are just species which haven't historically belonged to a particular system and the control of invasive species, which are just uh, populations which uh, become disproportionately, move into an area, then they become disproportionately represented within that particular area, or they exclude other indigenous populations, be that by predation or competition or whatever. So it's this protectionism that ecological neoliberals object to. Instead, that they argue, they argue that there should be open biotic borders in which you allow for the free movement of biological populations across the globe. When these populations go into a new area, you should allow them to grow. Uh, you shouldn't be controlling these populations. And this is in part because the free movement of populations creates new ecological markets. You know, new combinations of populations foster innovation and cre can create more productive ecosystems. Now, if our ultimate goal in conservation isn't to preserve existing systems, but instead to uh, preserve and uh, perhaps even increase uh, the production of ecological communities so these communities can provide direct economic services, uh, then we've got some sort of reason uh, to allow for the free movement of populations. So where is this particular argument found? Well, it's actually uh, not found that much within ecology itself. And in some ways, this is unsurprising. It's uh, largely critical of a large portion of ecology, how it's conducted. But more accurately, it as well is, uh, uh, it's a normative argument. It's an argument about the way that ecosystems should be rather than the way that they are. 
And given that there is this sort of normative component, it's unsurprising we see these types of debates. Where it's predominantly been found is within popular science publications. So these are books that are largely aimed for the public to engage with the educated public and try and change public opinion about the way that we should treat invasive species. One notable exception, which is really early on, is I want to uh, point out uh, probably one of the clearest explanations and representations of a large portion of these views uh, in the 2005, do non-native species threaten the natural environment? But from that point on, you know, most of the stuff that I'm discussing are in these popular science books. So they're all very recent. Uh, End of Wild is 06, Rambunctious Garden, 2011, Where Do Camels Belong, 2014, New Wilds, 2015, Inheritors of the Earth, 2017. Here's the last three of those books. All of these are New York Times bestsellers. And as well, uh, these ideas have turned up in op-eds in the New York Times, and The Economist has particularly written a series of articles which are strongly uh, supporting this invasive species skeptic view. Uh, as well, at my own university here at Sydney, uh, there's this multi-species justice institute and over at UTS Compassionate Conservation Institute, of which I've both seen talks which basically defend this view as well. So it's a rapidly sort of spreading view. So why would free market ideologues really get excited about this particular position? Well, there's two reasons why you might want to support this laissez-faire view of ecology. First of all, it removes a metaphor for the free movement of human populations. Often, you know, the sort of invasion uh, biology can be used to sort of argue against uh, the open globalized movement of human populations. But as well, rejecting invasion biology gets rid of real actual government regulations. A lot of trade regulations are actually built around uh, protecting, you know, uh, for biosecurity reasons, uh, uh, crops and resources and natural habitats in countries. And if you remove invasion biology as a major motivator, you're actually going to be able to remove a lot of government regulation. And The Economist has been a major supporter of invasive species skepticism. Uh, in the last 20 years, 54 articles mention uh, invasive species. Most of these are sort of dry mentions of the fact that populations can move along shipping lanes and that sort of thing. But a significant portion, seven, really strongly advocate for uh, invasive, uh, the free movement of biological populations and give a lot of page time to a lot of these uh, books like these ones. Uh, and it's not a new thing to have this uh, laissez-faire push for uh, ecosystems up there in the corner is Reason Magazine. This is all the way back in 2000 and sandwiched in between articles like In Praise of Consumerism, you have Attack of the Bio Invaders in which they make this argument, you know, that we should allow for the free movement of biological populations because they'll make more efficient markets. So you may ask, how did this happen? How do we get this sort of odd alliance between free market ideologues and animal rights activists? You know, two very middle class groups of activists, but usually not thought of as being on the same side. And as well, we've got this situation in which there's a bleeding of uh, political economics into conservation science. So how do we end up here? Uh, the first thing to note is that Ecology and economics are very deeply intertwined sciences. Uh, both consider very similar phenomena, the dynamics of populations. Both of them emerged really out of the work of Thomas Malthus, uh, and both of them share a lot of models. So models that were discovered in economics were later applied to ecology, and models that were discovered in ecology were later applied to economics. And you can see this even with something as simple as classic Malthusian growth to some sort of carrying capacity. So this particular model can be used to represent a species population rapidly increasing until it starts uh, uh, 
having a lack of resources to keep on growing and then it slows down and then it plateaus, you know, those resources could be water, it could be food, it could be uh, suitable nesting sites. But this model can also be used to represent the diffusion of new technology. So when a new iPhone is released, you know, you get a rapid uptick in the amount of people purchasing iPhones. But then at a certain stage, there's only so many people who can afford iPhones. And there's not that many people who want to buy multiple iPhones. And so using that particular model, you can also figure out when Apple is likely going to release a new iPhone. Uh, so using these models, you can take the descriptive aspects of one model and just apply it to different populations in both ecology and economics. But this is descriptive. The new thing is having normative arguments about the way that ecological markets should be arranged. And the way that this happened was two conceptual innovations, which will take a lot more time to discuss in a couple of minutes. So the first is the idea that we are preserving ecological systems or the goods of economic utility that they produce. So this is the ecosystem services literature. And the second is the discussion of novel ecosystems. So this is the discussion of the way that new arrangements of ecological systems can yield uh, uh, new, new things. And so with these two new ideas in hand, what it allowed is us to take an engineering stance to ecology. You can think about what the new arrangements of ecological systems are so that they give us goods of economic utility. We can ask how should ecosystems be constructed so they may provision services. All right, so that's the background. Now I'm going to really sort of like delve into these concepts and the way this argument is structured in a lot more detail. And it all really does start out with this new idea uh, of ecosystem services. So this is the idea again, that the reason why we're conserving ecosystems is because they provide us with economic goods. And the way originally that these goods were described was actually quite wide. It was very encompassing. Uh, it included recreational goods, it included cultural goods, it included the aesthetic goods that the environment provides. But because it was using this sort of language of economic utility, there was a need to immediately attempt to quantify it in such a way that it could be then sold to economists and then sold to governments. And when you look to sort of quantify these things, you're going to look for the things you can count uh, around in nature. And this new literature was born around the ecosystem services uh, uh, area in which people were looking to quantify the relationship between biodiversity and services. And the way they usually did this was by local species counts and their relationship to plant biomass. So you can see a classic graph there depicting the relationship between species counts and plant biomass, with plant biomass being thought of as a proxy for the economic utility of that area. Because having a more productive system which produces more things is thought to have more value. So you had this uh, shift as they were looking to quantify to discuss these, uh, to represent these things in terms of productivity. As pe more people discussed them in terms of productivity, you had uh, a narrowing of what people thought of as ecosystem services. And it sort of skewed the literature and it skewed the language about how we think about nature's value. And of course, as I've noted before, once you talk about these goods of economic utility, you get an idea which you're not just preserving ecosystems, you can also maximize your gain from ecosystems. You can think about how to design them in such a way that they get you more of the goods that you want rather than just preserving the goods that exist. And the way that ecosystem services were related to invasive species in this literature is via novel ecosystems. So novel ecosystems are again, this uh, arrangement of populations which have never existed before. 
Uh, so you have unique species combinations and because you have then uh, resources or productivity cycling through different populations, the thought is that innovation is created. And as well, novel ecosystems usually have more species. So Mauritius of the dodo fame, uh, it still has 90% of its 765 species. Sure, you've knocked off the dodo, but a lot of them are still left. But as well, you've added 730 new species to that area. Now, if you think that the reason you conserve these systems is because more species equals more services, then you're gonna say, hey, this is a good thing. You know, this is a much better ecosystem. It has uh, more pathways in which resources cycle, which is innovative. And we have more species, which due to the usual sort of species uh, curves in terms of uh, uh, economic utility, they're going to be uh, much more valuable. And a lot of people within this literature really emphasize the role that invasive species play in uh, acting to create innovation and respond to human altered environments. So uh, people particularly emphasize that novel ecosystems are really the new wildlands. They're the lands that aren't being controlled by humanity. So uh, as stated here, novel ecosystems represent the wildlands of the future, the self-organized response of nature to anthropogenic impacts. A lot of invasive species are adapted to humanity in some way. Also, they're adapted to a warming climate a lot of the time. They then self-organize in the spaces that we disrupt and you know they're creating new combinations of species that are able to respond to the anthropogenic world. So this leads some of these authors to say, you know, these are the real sources of nature's innovation and where we're going to get the true survivors into the next several hundred years. So as Fred Pierce says, by seeking only to conserve and protect the endangered and the weak, it becomes a break on evolution and a dowser on adaptation. If we want to assist nature to regenerate, we need to promote change rather than taunt it back. So instead of having conservation be about, you know, tightly managed systems, you know, which we have to sort of be constantly intervening on to maintain, you know, we should instead think about it in terms of the innovative areas that are able to respond to the world that we're actually actively creating. And it's not just species combinations that are changing and creating sources of innovation. Uh, Fred Pierce, uh, no, I mean, not Fred Pierce, uh, Chris Thomas particularly emphasizes the role of invasive species as uh, sources of innovation in evolution. You know, these new populations move into new areas and they start adapting, but as well, they create competition with uh, native species and this can then drive evolution. You know, you can think about this in neoliberal language as, you know, facilitated disruptors to the workplace. You know, I'm sure some middle manager at your university has tried something like that. Uh, and, you know, so you get these populations moving into the area and uh, then adaptive change. Uh, in Australia, you've got cane toads coming into the country and then they very rapidly evolve to be larger and hop west. Like, that's crazy, but, you know, that's what we found. You know, uh, Australian snakes in response to cane toads have all become larger with smaller jaws. So they can't eat as large cane toads. And if they do, they have a larger body weight, so they're less likely to die of poison. Uh, St. John's wart throughout the US, uh, well, North America more accurately, uh, has went through rapid genetic changes in the last 200 years, which have been mapped uh, and many plants go through this rapid uh, set of genetic changes to respond to their new habitats. It's well recorded that ants, when they move into a new region, form super colonies, which then outcompete many of the native uh, 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 ants because they end up sort of coordinating between their different colonies. And it's not just this type of evolution that occurs, uh, something I wasn't even aware of uh, which Thomas particularly emphasizes is the role of hybridization uh, with invasive species. 
So new combinations of genes coming together and this being a source of uh, biotic innovation. Uh, so he uses the example of the UK. I think when it comes to invasion biology, you should never use the UK. It's a really, really bad example. Uh, but I'll just go with the example that he uses. He notes that there are 88 hybrids between native and introduced plant species and 26 between uh, two or more introduced species. So they're hybridizing all over the place. And this isn't just in plants. You know, in New Zealand, you have uh, still populations. Uh, in North America, you've got various trout populations. It's all across the tree of life that you find when you introduce populations into a new region, they often end up hybridizing and creating their own varietals uh, within those areas. And something that is uh, well recorded and does have a lot of support is the fact that invasive species do often contribute uh, ecosystem services. Even more moderate views in this area really heavily emphasize that we should consider the role of invasive species in provisioning us with economic services. Uh, so here I'm thinking of the well-known paper, Don't Judge Species on Their Origin. Uh, Ken Thompson does a really good job of uh, going through some different ways that invasive populations do provide important services. So uh, zebra mussels, which you probably would be familiar with, uh, they uh, have invaded multiple freshwater lake systems throughout the US, but a lot of these lake systems were heavily polluted, extremely turbid, uh, and having this hyper abundant filter feeder has improved the water quality throughout a lot of these systems in really quite profound ways. Uh, he discusses kudzu, but this is true of uh, many different weed species. Uh, they invade often highly disturbed areas. They then form monocultures, uh, but often after sort of like 20 to 50 years, these monocultures die off and you allow for the invasion uh, or the movement back in of many different other species in what is now much more fertile soil. So I've got a, a local example, which is the uh, lantana. And as well, invasive populations provide critical habitats for uh, endangered species. So uh, this is something that I've noticed myself, uh, clearing blackberry bushes along the Natai uh, National Forest. You know, sometimes you'll find a bird's nest in there and it makes it hard to sort of decide about whether you're going to uh, remove this plant when you've got a possibly endangered indigenous population making residence in it. And Matt Chu has heavily em emphasized the role of tamarisk in the US as providing critical habitat for endangered species. So invasive species are going to be a pretty effective source of uh, services naturally because what it means to be invasive is to be hyperabundant and cycle a lot of resources. You know, they're going to process a lot of biomass. So really it's going to be expected that they are going to have quite a large effect when you're interested in the productivity of ecosystem and ecosystems and the cycling of resources. So as Fred Pierce notes, services are done by the species at hand that do it best. In much of the world, this increasingly means nature's pesky, pushy invaders. Now, you may say, well, what about the indigenous populations, which may be uh, excluded or predated by these new species moving in. And, you know, the authors here state that extinction and the loss of these populations should be both accepted and expected. Uh, Fred Pierce particularly is, uh, not Fred Pierce, uh, Chris Thomas is particularly critical of the New Zealand attempts to uh, get rid of predators so that they pr may preserve their endemic species on that island, uh, particularly bird species. He states that while it is a great pity that a thousand species of island bird have disappeared, this event may not have much, if any, effect on the long-term evolutionary future of birds. 
Nearly all these island forms were ultimately descended from flight capable, predator savvy and disease resistant birds that started out their life on the world's continents. Now, he uses uh, uh, this to sort of say, well, you know, these populations are basically on the way out. They're not going to be able to respond to the world that we're creating. And we just need to accept they're going to go because the long-term future is going to be in these other populations, which are able to respond to uh, the degraded sort of natural world we're creating. Uh, so here's a picture of the New Zealand uh, takahe. This is a large flightless bird, which uh, lives in the mountains of New Zealand currently. Uh, I was fortunate enough to see one fairly recently. And on the left is the very, very closely related Australasian swamp hen. Uh, now, while one is you know, nearing extinction, the other is widely th found throughout New Zealand, Australia, Papua New Guinea. In fact, there's a couple just across the road from me just now in the park. Uh, so the thought is that why would you spend all this money on a population with no long-term future when you've got a very closely related population uh, which can survive into the future? And so, again, these populations that should be surviving are the ones with adaptions to humanity, which can then uh, be abundant enough to produce us with economic services and functioning ecosystems. Now, you may sort of like dig your heels in and go, well, no, I, I really would like to see a world with takahe and, you know, unique life forms that exist right now. And if you do that, then you're going to be accused by a lot of these authors of xenophobia. Increasingly, the debate around invasive species is employing another tool of neoliberal advocacy. And this is the arguments that any stances against migration are xenophobia. You know, we see this in the human case, of course, uh, workers and unions often oppose high migration because open borders increases uh, competition for working class jobs. And then you get corporate interests and uh, uh, various sort of like uh, uh, business owners then stating that any stance against migration is just a case of xenophobia. And then you often get middle class people sort of falling in line and, you know, adopting this position because it's not their jobs ever on the line. You know, they get various social capitals for taking this stance, but never get any sort of like loss. So in the same way you're seeing in the biological case that uh, anyone who defends indigenous populations is being accused of xenophobia against the free movement of these other biological populations. So this is a somewhat of new development, but it actually emerged out of the ecology itself. You know, many of the ecologists were deeply worried about the language that they were using and rightly so, you know, using words like invasive, alien, foreign, interloper, various militaristic language uh, did involve the scientists employing, you know, uh, troubled language from a troubled history. And a lot of the ecologists themselves were arguing that, you know, they were using this uh, set of misplaced metaphors, which were misleading the science, and we needed some sort of correction to the language involved. But what this was taken to say was not what it's taken to say now. You know, in probably one of the original papers and the best papers, I think, on this particular topic, Brown and Sachs, uh, 2004, they state, it is not to argue that exotic species are good so that their spread should be fostered. It is not to suggest that modern humans should let nature take its course and elect not to intervene in the dynamics of dispersal and extinction. It is to plead for more scientific, scientific objectivity and less emotional xenophobia. Now you can take this quote and just remove the knots and you get the modern position. It is to argue that exotic species are good so that their spread should be fostered. It is to suggest that modern humans should let nature take its course. So what the modern position is, is this idea that the language shows that the scientists are engaged in irrational prejudice 
And this can completely discount the science as it's currently conducted, and it can be used to basically jettison the things that we know already. Uh, it's pretty worrying as far as I'm concerned. And you often see this view particularly coming out of the animal rights wing of the neoliberal advocacy. Uh, this particularly comes out in uh, uh, publications like uh, this one. So you got from the Huffington Post, biological xenophobia, in which they're just saying that any sort of uh, uh, control of populations is just xenophobia. Uh, in the New York Times, you have Mother Nature's Melting Pot, in which they argue for cosmopolitan ecosystems. Uh, in this paper down the bottom, you've got them citing the alt write news site bug out news as if ecologists are reading know what bug out news are reading bug out news and this is influencing their thoughts and this is in some way uh, uh you know the reason why ecologists do what they do and then uh you've got one of my favorites uh weed whackers in which they argue that invasive species are a conspiracy of the monsanto corporation to sell more roundup uh you know, there's all sorts of arg articles coming out, you know, within these sort of like uh, neoliberal left uh, publications, which really like this uh, set of view, you know, employing some of the language from, you know, political discourse to ecological discourse. And generally, you know, you get this drawing of comparisons between ecologists and some sort of form of right wing thought in a way to disc discount ecology as it's being conducted. And again, this isn't particularly new. Peretti in 1998, you know, attempted to make some sort of connection between Nazi and apartheid governments and conservation science as a way of discounting the existence of conservation science. Uh, and here's another uh, pretty, you know, damning quote, uh, which appeared in the New York Times recently. Uh, Daniel Ramp, the director of the Center for Conservation Compassionate Conservation in Sydney argues that Australia's uh, feral cat program is based on unexamined stigmas towards invasive species. I can't help but use terms like xenophobia. It's gobsmacking how much hatred there is. So if you want to protect indigenous species against, you know, the spread of uh, predators or introduced species that are suppressing their populations, you're just irrationally prejudiced against, you know, cat populations or similar. And you may say, well, you know, this is a pretty out there position, Chris, you know, uh, uh, saying that, you know, this is some sort of neoliberal position, uh, you know, making this sort of uh, equating these two views. Uh, I was quite heartened to find this particular review from the ecologist, John Halley, who had a very similar response to me upon reading uh, Chris Thomas's Inheritors of the Earth. He states that Thomas goes on, backing losers may be honorable in intention, but backing winners will be more effective. The condescending tone may not win over everyone who has a different opinion. I had a feeling of deja vu with this argument. It is the same one used by the promoters of globalization in the early 90s. In those days, it was suggested that globalization represented some inexorable flow of history that could not be resisted. So you better get on the right side of history because this is going to happen no matter what you want. Uh, you know, there's going to be a globalized anthropogenic environment and, you know, you better get behind the populations that are going to win in the long-term future. The thought is here. So... Same sort of idea being rep replicated, you know, within the public sphere to sort of really get in the minds of the public and get them supporting invasive species. Now, I want to note that the people involved in this movement all have substantive disagreements. You know, there's differences in strength. Uh, so, you know, there's people who just say we need to watch our language. You know, that's not really even part of this movement, but, you know, all the way down to sort of like Brown and Sax, hence the, hence the Brown saxophone. Uh, but then you get really radical views like uh, uh, Fred Pierce's, where it's basically saying that, you know, we should be promoting invasive species. All right. So that's the viewpoint uh, in a nutshell. Now I'm going to 
present uh, some reasons why you shouldn't really agree with it, or at least I think you really shouldn't. Uh, so I'm going to sort of uh, provide two different types of responses. So the first is to try and deny the relationship between open biotic borders, the free movement of populations, and the supply of human goods. And I think that there is generally a really weak relationship between local species richness and human goods. I think this is highly undersupported. Uh, and as well, I'm going to note that natural selection and rapid change don't yield innovation to the same extent that preserving extant species that have had millions of years of evolution does. And the second, I'm going to sort of go down the line of, yeah, sure, we can accept this metaphor, but there's still good reason to reject neoliberalism, you know, or at least biotic neoliberalism. You know, a globalized biology might not be a good thing. And as well, we have been down this road before. You know, we've seen these arguments pop up 150 years ago already. And it was a really, really ugly history and we shouldn't be doing this again. So there's a couple of reasons why we should be going down this line. All right, so first of all, local species richness yields ecosystem services. This is an incredibly weak relationship. Uh, it's not particularly well supported. Uh, I'm first of all, just going to sort of point to a couple of chapters in Defending Biodiversity, this book, they do a really good job of breaking down the relationship between ecosystem services and local species richness. But the first thing to note is that, as mentioned before, services uh, were first proposed in this wide description to include things like aesthetic value, recreational value, cultural value. Once you start using the language of productivity, you immediately jettison all of those and you end up not being able to actually account for all of those important factors which explain the economic value of these systems. But even more so, once you move to this language of production, you know, having a productive ecosystem, then you end up ignoring most of the things that we actually engaged in conservation to try and preserve. You don't end up preserving endangered populations. You don't end up preserving functionally extinct populations. You don't end up preserving just low population species because they don't have the standing populations to be able to affect ecosystem productivity as hyperabundant populations. So the very reasons we engaged in conservation are just immediately ignored once you shift to the language of ecosystems being valuable in so much as they produce resources. Um, you know, it's a complete change in the way that we think about conservation. And once we talk about production, we miss a lot of the really important values that biodiversity provides. Uh, having a really diverse ecosystem is important because having uh, unique relationships to this area fosters uh, heritage value. So the unique relationship we have to an environment, you know, allows us to feel some sort of connection to the place and this then fosters heritage value. But as well, uh, one of the most important ways that biodiversity supplies value, which has nothing to do with the immediate production, uh, is option value. So having unique populations allows us to have options, you know, ways that we could use these populations in the future. We don't actually know how we could use them or how we might want to use them. As well, we might have our aesthetic and cultural values change in the future. We don't know what things we're going to like in the future. So we need to preserve a range of different biotic resources into the future. This is still a purely economics argument, but it doesn't involve this language of production. We want to preserve unique things. Next, we have this key empirical claim that the introduction of new species will create innovation and innovation will create goods. I think this is nearly completely unsupported in this literature. Uh, it's just basically stated by fiat and then not defended at all. You know, they just use basically the analogy of human markets. You know, you throw in new businesses in an area and that'll lead to innovation in some way. You know, 
really it's an undefended idea and it's quite clearly i think wrong um you know when you add new species to an area you don't have natural selection you know optimizing for innovation or for uniqueness or for difference you know natural selection doesn't have long term planning you end up with a rapid sort of like short term optimization for the things that can actually survive in these new systems and when you're throwing multiple populations into a new area really changing you know the uh biological makeup of that area what you end up doing is you actually end up selecting for biological generalists so these are species that can eat or consume lots of different resources survive in multiple different situations and you end up selecting against uh specialists and the thing is specialists which have spent you know millions of years highly adapting to a quite narrow set of circumstances you know may die off in these situations but their unique adaptations are often the things that we're interested in when we're talking about biodiversity having unique biochemical pathways unique adaptations unique um, morphology these are often the things that we're actually interested in when we're thinking about nature rather than the broad brush features of generalist populations and what this all leads to is some sort of mcdonaldization of nature you end up with a huge homogenization of ecological systems across the world and this really uh diminishes people's investment in their own local system because their own local system just looks like any other place in the world uh having all these generalist populations with just minor adaptations to the local circumstances aren't going to be the same sort of diversity as having you know populations which have evolved for millions of years in that local set of circumstances so on pretty much any biodiversity metric uh be these functional diversity phylogenetic diversity genetic diversity we're ending up with a situation in which in which we have a massive a uh, diminishment of biodiversity in the world by just having you know a couple of generalist species you know adding rats cats and pigeons to every single ecosystem in the world doesn't increase biodiversity uh and you know you can think about this in terms of sort of mcdonald's you know uh there are differences in the sort of generalist approach of mcdonald's to australia and japan in australia you can get a burger with a slice of beetroot on it in japan you can get a burger with some teriyaki sauce on it but in this end it's just bloody mcdonald's you know there's not actually that much of a difference involved and you're not getting the same sort of unique options that would then allow people to really value these systems in a unique way and homogenization leads to real economic losses you know you can think about this in terms of monopoly and absolute advantage Australia has an absolute advantage when it comes to quokka selfies. You know, people come around the world to sit down on a beach and take a photo with a really cute little marsupial. Now, sure, cats are great apparently, uh but you know, you can if you put cats on those islands, you're going to wipe out this population and you're going to wipe out all that economic utility that comes with them. and as well we can think about things in terms of comparative advantage so australia has an absolute advantage when it comes to wild camel populations we have the only wild camel population in the world uh since it was lost from all of its indigenous range uh but you need to think about the opportunity cost involved with camels you know maybe the camel population is going to express multiple different indigenous populations and they may have their own economic utility so we need to consider the role of uniqueness and opportunity cost when it comes to various invasive populations so here's the ideas that are sort of based around this uh economics and the relationship between species richness and you know open biotic borders uh uh and the goods of economic utility we gain now i'm going to point out some of the sort of uh more uh moral worries i think with adopting this ecological neoliberal stance and i really 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 hate going down this line uh 
of sort of pointing out the implicit xenophobia or as well the sort of ideological problems are attached to taking this position because I think that the perception outside of the humanities is basically that it's devolved into a bunch of white people pointing at each other and accusing each other of white racism. Uh, and I don't really want to contribute to that perception or that way of doing things. But I do want to say that I think that there's something truly, truly, truly egregious about seeing American and UK academics stand up in front of crowd and say that, you know, New Zealand, New, New Zealand uh, Maori and uh, Indigenous Australians are in some way xenophobic for wanting to protect their totem species. You know, it's it's a really bizarre situation. And, you know, hopefully people can sort of move past this type of language uh, and, you know, think about things in a much more uh, ecumenical way. But the fact is that, you know, these arguments were used previously in some pretty horrific ways. You know, ecological neoliberalism isn't a new idea. It was the same ideas that were used to justify the acclimatization societies of the 1850s and 1860s. Really, uh, we're just seeing this rediscovery of biotic colonialism in which you say basically, you know, there is this globalized biological free market, you know, uh, we should happily introduce European species in. The indigenous species are on the way out. A lot of the original authors were actually citing, you know, uh, Malthus and Darwin in these same manners to make the case that, you know, native populations are going to die out and, you know, we need to introduce these new populations. And even more so, they were making arguments along the lines that, uh, the introduction of Europeans has caused environmental destruction. This environmental destruction requires the introduction of new populations, which are more robust and less likely to die out. And, you know, these populations are going to be of economic utility to the people within this local area. So we need to introduce them and just let the indigenous populations die out. Uh, so if there's uh, actually any sort of like budding Marxist historians, there's a really nice paper to uh, be written about the re-emergence uh, within middle-class European descendants of the same arguments uh, as occurred, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, and this same rhetoric wasn't just applied to biotic populations. This rhetoric about these populations being on the way out and, you know, we need to just sort of step aside and let it happen. You know, in really sort of horrific history, particularly within Australia, uh, these acclimatization arguments were actually applied to Indigenous peoples and Indigenous cultures. You know, the labelling of Indigenous species as relic species uh, mirrors the same language that was used towards Indigenous peoples as dying races. And in both of these cases, what we're seeing are these claims uh, that these populations are on the way out. And, you know, this sheds the inconvenient fact that is our continued action and inactions are the reasons why this destruction is happening. You know, it's a way of sort of washing moral responsibility and stepping away when we think about the environment and think about the maltreatment of people and sort of saying that, you know, this is inevitable, this is happening, you know, we can step back and just sort of uh, uh, wash ourselves of any sort of moral culpability. And I think you can really see this as well uh, in the blurb of this 2006 book, you know, uh, biodiversity is dead, let's save surfaces. You know, they write that the end of wild is a wake up call that argues that although it may be too late to save biodiversity, we can take steps to save our ecosystems. So biodiversity is dead, it's on the way out. You know, what we need to do is preserve and act to preserve the economic utility of these systems in the immediate future. And I think that this is a really, really bad position and we should be aiming to protect in, uh, biodiversity across the globe in all of its forms. All right, so that's basically the talk. Um, so really 
I'm hoping that I have convinced you that there is an emerging position out there in the literature, which is worthy of this term, you know, ecological neoliberalism. Uh, I think that uh, this is an idea out there which think uh, which considers the value of ecosystems as being derived from the goods that they produce. And, you know, given that ecosystems are basically biological marketplaces, we can treat them in the same way as human marketplaces where open biotic borders and, you know, the free movement of populations is going to result in uh, maximising the efficiency of these markets as opposed to protected biological markets, which is what we've aimed to do up to this point. You know, I think that we can deny and argue against this particular worldview by presenting the value conservation has other than productivity. Uh, we can show that open borders doesn't yield diversity and in innovation in the way that these people say they are. Uh, we can argue that the metaphor isn't really apt, you know, that there isn't really this clear relationship between ecological markets and uh, human marketplaces. And as well, we can argue along the lines that this metaphor is apt, but it's immoral because, you know, we did this 150 years ago and it was horrific. Uh, so thank you. Um, hopefully I've somewhat convinced or interested you for, you know, whatever period I was just, uh, yammering on for. So cheers.